Um, it's my uh, pleasure to introduce our next speaker, the Colorado Attorney General, Phil Weiser. <laughs> Phil is the 39th Attorney General of Colorado as the state's chief legal officer. He is committed to protecting the people of Colorado, defending the rule of law, and building a department of law that serves all Coloradoans effectively. Previously, Weiser served as a professor of law and dean of the University of Colorado Law School, where he founded the Silicon Flatirons Center for Law, Technology, and Entrepreneurship. Weiser served in senior leadership positions in the Obama administration and was appointed to serve as a Deputy Assistant Attorney General in the U.S. Department of Justice and a Senior Advisor for Technology and Innovation at the White House's National Economic Council. Earlier in his career, he co-chaired the Colorado Innovation Council and served in President Bill Clinton's Department of Justice. After graduating law school, he worked in Denver for, for Judge David Ebel, on the Tenth Circuit Court of Appeals and, and held two clerkships at the U.S. Supreme Court for Justices Byron White and Ruth Bader Ginsburg. Attorney General Weiser lives in Denver with his wife, Dr. Heidi Wald, and their two children. Welcome. So good afternoon. I really want to have a conversation. I see such thoughtful, engaged people here. I'll start, though, with three points. First, the right to vote. Second, what Bernie was talking about, gerrymandering. And third, the Baca case, which we here in Colorado are involved in. Number one, the right to vote. I just authored a statement that will get out there about Sunday, Bloody Sunday. How many people here remember Sunday, Bloody Sunday? So, Bloody Sunday, I guess there's the U2 version and there's the American version. <laughs> I'm talking about the American version of John Lewis. It was the day that shocked our nation and brought us the Voting Rights Act of 1965. When Lyndon Johnson gave a speech about voting rights, if I've got this right, he ended by saying, we shall overcome. And what we had to overcome was a legacy of discrimination in voting. The right to vote was not something that was born with American democracy. It's something we've had to develop. In fact, until the 15th Amendment, there was no right to vote in the Constitution. If you're a woman, you had to wait till the 19th Amendment. By the way, what's the first state as a state that allowed women to vote? Colorado, baby. Wyoming did get there first as a territory. And it was said that their motivation was less pure than ours because they had a very low uh, female to male ratio. <laughs> it was strategic, where ours was purely spiritual and moral. <laughs> and what I would say is the right to vote is not something we can be complacent about because American history shows we've had frequent denials of the right to vote, literacy tests, poll taxes, taking people off voter rolls. And unfortunately, in a recent decision, this was the, I think, Shelby County versus Holder decision, the Voting Rights Act was gutted by the U.S. Supreme Court. And memorably, in dissent, Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg said, getting rid of this Voting Rights Act protection called the plea clearance process is like going outside with an umbrella and saying, I'm not getting wet, it all must be fine, and throwing away your umbrella. Well, we are here in Colorado, a model of what the right to vote looks like. Mail-in balloting, automatic registration, not allowing felons to be disenfranchised. We are a model for our nation and it's because of all of you. So thank you for your leadership. Yeah, give me. And to Bernie's point, why in Z passed, did he say 70%? Yes, 70% 70 of Coloradans got a very simple premise. Districts should be drawn by the people and for the people, not 
by elected officials who want to figure out who's in their district so they can stay as incumbents without facing real competition. This premise of citizen-drawn districts and an antidote to gerrymandering should be the norm for every state, but it's not. If you look at Maryland's districts or Wisconsin's districts, you see districts that can only be drawn for the purpose of extreme partisan gerrymandering. I believe that's unconstitutional. We argued as much in vain. Because the Supreme Court, unfortunately, took a principle that I don't believe is right. We shouldn't be in the business of drawing districts and duck that case. Now, by the way, if you believe that principle is right, they should also overrule their constitutional rules against racial gerrymandering and the rules calling for one person, one vote, and against malapportionment. So even if you believe the principle, I'm not sure the court has it right because they haven't actually applied it consistently. So that leaves it up to the states. And we here in Colorado, again, are a model for the nation with YNZ. We got one more chance to be a model. It's how we manage the Electoral College. How many people here could name a single elector on the ballot in 2016? We got a couple ringers here. <laughs> Most people have no idea who the electors are because they're voting who they want to be president or the party whose candidate they want to vote for. In Colorado, it has long been the law that when you are an elector, you are pledged to vote for the party you represent and the candidate you're associated with because no one thinks they're voting for a free agent to make up his or her mind on a later date. They believe they're voting for a candidate and that candidate expects electors to vote as they pledge. That's the law in Colorado. It hadn't ever been enforced before 2016 when electors said, I'd like to vote for someone else, not the person I'm required to vote for. And the Secretary of State said, you can't do that. Went ahead and got state court guidance that that elector could and should be removed in the face of such called a protest vote. And so that elector was removed and a new elector was elected and the Colorado electors voted as they were required to under Colorado law. Well, that removed elector, his name is Michael Baca, has now made a federal case out of it. And that case is going to the U.S. Supreme Court. And at stake here is the following principle. Will the will of the voters for presidential elections be followed? Will the authority given under the Constitution to the states to manage the electors be honored? Because if not, any elector could take a bribe, and the state couldn't do a darn thing about it. This is a pretty scary thought. It would wreak havoc and chaos with our elections. And for a long time, the parties have been the main instrument for federal presidential elections. And the 12th Amendment was actually adopted because of the reality of party politics. It used to be that you thought maybe the person who comes in second could become the a vice president, and that was on this old model that you wouldn't have parties and party slates. Well, pretty quickly, it got established. We're, we're, we're a country with two main political parties. The parties have changed over time, but there have always been two. And the 12th Amendment changed the situation and said, we're not going to go for the person who comes in second to be vice president. We're going to have separate ballots so that each party can nominate a separate person for president and vice president. So this case gets argued in April at the U.S. Supreme Court, and the decision is going to matter because we in Colorado want to make sure we honor the will of the voters. And I believe, like the right to vote, like our stance against extreme partisan gerrymandering, we'll defend the will of the people in the Baca case. So thank you for your time. I'd love to take some questions, thoughts, and ideas. All right, I have my favorite one. Back there, and I'll repeat the question if we can't get a mic there. I got a mic. This is not a question. You said you had thoughts and ideas? Okay. <laughs> I hope Michael Baca wins. And this is why, because it would point out how ridiculous the Electoral College is, and maybe nationwide we could do something to get rid of it. But Michael Baca had a right to do what he did. I, I agree with the uh, with court case law up to now. And, and the fact that it contravened the will of the voters just shows you how bad the whole electoral college system is? That's totally a question. <laughs> Thank you for your view and the question. Let me offer a couple important responses. 
Um, Michael Baca violated state law. The question is whether the state law is unconstitutional. What I would tell you is it takes a very creative reading of constitutional law to make his argument. And so far, out of lots and lots of courts, only one has taken that view, and it was here in Colorado, our federal appeals court. The Supreme Court will have the last word on whether the Constitution gives electors the ability to be free agents and prevent states from limiting the judgment of electors and requiring electors to follow the popular vote in those states. Obviously, I believe I will and should win agrees with that. As for your instrumental view, I would just say the following. There is a view of politics you might call the chaos theory of politics. <laughs> if you want things to change, invite and welcome in chaos, and then we'll get order on the back end. I'm really nervous about that theory of politics. <laughs> a lot of people tried it in 2016. I would submit it's not worth the damage along the way. I don't want to see a presidential election where electors are willing and able to say, I'm willing to sell my vote to the right bidder because we have hijacked democracy. The Electoral College is far from perfect. We can have a great discussion about the Electoral College vis-a-vis -vis pick your alternative. And if there's a constitutional amendment to replace it, we can have another great discussion that would proceed in an orderly process. What I'm not excited about seeing is the theory of chaos in action. Other thoughts, questions, and ideas? Yes? I just want to know, so will you be arguing? Will you be arguing this case? When do you argue the case? And are you just, like, scared about doing that? <laughs> uh, three questions there. <laughs> I love multi-part questions. First, last week of April is the argument. Second, this case is consolidated with Washington which means we are going to have some uh, negotiation of exactly how that happens. I will tell you, in my fantasy version of being Attorney General of Colorado, it would include getting to argue for the U.S. Supreme Court. I did clerk before, uh, with Justice White and Justice Ginsburg on the court. I've argued in the Federal Court of Appeals here in Colorado, but not, never the Supreme Court. I've worked on Supreme Court cases before, but haven't had a chance to argue. If I had that opportunity, would I be nervous? Damn straight I would be. 